So welcome, like I said, it's the second in our Lincoln City Nature Challenge series. Um, the City Nature Challenge is a global event that looks to um, explore and record biodiversity, especially in urban areas. Um, so Lincoln and Omaha will be joining over 300 other cities around the world this year to participate in this event. And the observation window for this event is the last day of April through May 3rd. Um, if you would like to know more about the event, I'll put some information in the chat uh, for the website so you can learn more about it. Um, but today we're gonna have Dennis Ferraro from UNL um, talk to us about amphibians, reptiles, and turtles of Lancaster County. So I'm going to let Dennis go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you. I see a lot of familiar names and faces, kind of repeat offenders, like kind of groupies. Um, but so this is more talking about uh, what you can find in Lancaster County, most likely uh, at the end of this month. And I'm going to go through a quick PowerPoint and then we'll go to a, um, my website, which will help you identify everything, including the frog call. So let me share that screen right now. And has everybody seen that screen? Okay. So when we talk about and kind of the slang for looking for amphibians, turtles, and reptiles is herping. So, Dennis, I think we're seeing your background of your computer and not the slideshow. Okay, let's stop that one. You got to see my baby alligator then? <laughs> you did. Okay, he's a year old now. That's when he was just hatched. Okay, let's see what happened here. I have three screens here and we want to make sure we get the right one. Okay, you have it now? Yep, you got it. Okay. A little technicality there we got going. So this is um, pretty much a great thing to do. It not only is fun, but it's for conservation because this data can be used for scientists across the state, not only herpetologists, but you know we're doing this also for ornithologists, mammologists, and entomologists, and even ichthyologists. So we can find out what we have in certain urbanized areas, and because of that, we can look at what we need to help. If we know it should be here and people aren't seeing it, then that tells us where we may need to make some habitat for those uh, species to have biodiversity. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do, so this first is brought to you by the University of Nebraska Herpetology Lab, and as you can see probably down there is the website, and this you can put on your phone, it's a free website, that has a guide and a field guide to all the amphibians, turtles, and reptiles of the state of Nebraska, it's updated, and not during this event, but during other times, because this event you will log what you see into iNaturalist, but other times of the year you can log your herpetological findings, amphibians, um, turtles, and reptiles, into um, this website, um, which where it says report sighting. And that's secure, which means other people can't see it, um, it's just for scientists and our database that's used by the University and Nebraska Game and the Parks Commission. So the biggest thing is data. And if you can at all remember when you're out there and you see something or you're just looking for something, to try to write down as much data as possible. And we're not talking about really hard things to write down. Most of the stuff you can get on your smartphone. The time and date, and I like it in 24 hours, but however you want to do it. The location, of course, for this event, it's going to be Lancaster County. But if you can get the GPS, the lat long, off your phone, that'd be great. And what's the cloud cover? Or is it sunny? This makes a lot of difference to us. Because if it, you see something that shouldn't be out when it's sunny, and it is, 
that gives us some data to think about. Also, what's the wind like real close to the ground? Is it windy or is it calm or is it just medium wind? Uh, air temperature, and you can get this on your phone now. In fact, you can get a little thing that goes on your smartphone that gives you the wind speed. Um, relative humidity, you can, some phones give you this, some don't. But if you have that, go ahead and put that in. And then if you just, you know, if you're around a pond or a waterway, especially if you're looking for frogs and salamanders and turtles, just a thermometer so you can see what the water temperature is. It kind of tells us when these uh, species are coming out of their brumnation or hibernation. And then are you in a sandy area? Are you in a forest area? Are you on concrete or a trail or on grass? So just the type of ground cover or vegetation. So if, if you think about it and you have a notebook, and this is great for families, you can have certain you know people write certain things down and other uh, parts of the family or group write other things down, and it becomes a family event and you get everything gathered. And it's really nice um, being a citizen scientist to help us scientists, but plus you can keep a journal and especially if you're, you have a lot of young people, they can keep that journal for the rest of their life and go back and look at it. And they'll really learn over time. So when you're looking for amphibians, reptiles, and turtles, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can just go to a single location, uh, a place that you usually go to, like a city park or a um, state park that's in the city or adjacent to the city or in the county, you can walk on a, a straight line. We call this transects. And you go along the straight line or along a road, along a roadside ditch, preferably someplace that's a trail or a gravel road where there's not any traffic. You want to make sure everybody's safe. Um, or you can just go back and forth in a field. Or you can just crisscross the area looking for things, okay? And we call this the grid search or quadrant, okay? So you can do any one of these, and they all are helpful. So you can pick a location. You can just walk straight from one end to the next on a trail. Um, it's very, it could be a bike trail, a walking trail, and call that your transect. And you probably can cover a mile or even more. And along that mile, what did you see on each side? You can do one side on the way up and one side on the way down. Just to show you a little statistics, that most of the creatures you're looking for are secretive. And by secretive, I mean, and this is what we call search detection. So if you're just out looking, okay, um, in a normal, and again, it depends on where you're at and what the animals are, um, the probability of finding a salamander is only about one third, about 33 percent. The probability of finding frogs around a pond, that's really high. That's probably 85 percent, okay? The probability of seeing turtles, well, if they're out basking, that's a good one third percent. But to see things like lizards and snakes, you're lucky if you get 20 percent, 15 or 20 percent detection probability because they're secretive and they're hiding under things or they only come out at a certain time. So just take this into consideration. People say, well, I never see any snakes. Well, they don't want you to see them, and they may be there. Um, you know, being a herpetologist in Nebraska for over 35 years now, I can almost tell you, you know, all of our reptiles and amphibians and turtles, you give me the name of it, I'll tell you what county I can find it and in what month. But I it, that's taken 30 years of gathering data. So I can find any of them, except for one. I don't want to talk about that one anymore, because I don't think it still exists in the state. Um, but I can go and find it. I might have to wait a month, or wait till the weather's just right, and go to a particular place, but I can find all 63 of the 64 perps of the state. One thing I wanted to say, so when you see these things, we're going to record them and we're going to photograph them and I'll talk about the photographing in a minute. You can do that with your, your smartphone or a camera or any kind of device or maybe just write down the description. 
for not collecting. To collect anything, you need a special education collecting permit from Game and Parks. And if you have to maybe corral it to take a good picture for something like a frog, that's permissible, but you should not move it, okay? In fact, here are the laws enacted uh, uh, considering amphibians and reptiles, and this includes turtles. This law was written in 2002 when turtles were still considered reptiles. Um, but it says no amphibian or reptile or turtle can be put back in the wild more than 100 yards from where you capture it. So you can't move it home or do anything with it. You gotta just do it right where you're at. Don't even try to move it more than say three feet if you can. Get it out of harm's way if it's on a trail or maybe on a small place where you can take a good picture and then put it right back if you need to do that. If you can get the picture without even touching the animal, that's the best ever, okay? And remember, no native amphibian, turtle, or reptile can be sold or offered for sale or taken out of our state. So these are the um, two of our uh, regulations I definitely right up front want you to know. Okay, when you're taking those pictures, if you can possibly throw a ruler next to or something, even a dot, well, how about a quarter instead of a dollar bill? A dollar bill probably float away. But something that if you need it identified, you need it verified by myself or another expert, um, and this is true whether it's a, something like a small mammal or maybe um, an insect, if you can put some kind of frame of reference there. And so, you know, you might just get a couple of real inexpensive rulers. And it, you'll know if it's a small little ruler and you throw it next to a frog or you even float it on the water near the frog um, or near the snake, uh, it probably won't even phase it if, it if it's a small little ruler. And then you can get a picture that has what we call frame of reference. So an expert can see how large it is. Because if you just take a picture of the animal, um, sometimes it's hard for the expert to know exactly what size it is. And sometimes size is critical um, when it comes to proper identification. And nowadays, there's really inexpensive uh, lenses you can put on any smartphone that are macro or telescoping. I have a set that I think cost me less than $25 for my phone. And, it, and I'm amazed at the pictures I can get. Okay. Um, again, and you can, if you have a camera, that even helps. And I'm just showing some of the pictures here. Look how, you know, with these plants, how macro this is and, and what you can do. Or you can put your phone on a stick and get it close to the animal. That way you won't harm the animal. The animal can't cause any problems for you if it's the type of animal that may do that. And you can get an excellent uh, image that you can put on eye naturals. So, like I said, probably when it comes to herbivora, the most prominent thing that you're going to find easily are our anurans or frogs and toads. Um, and you can you can take pictures from the shore. Um, here's the leopard frogs. These are northern leopard frogs. In Lancaster County, we have more plains leopard frogs, but you won't be able to tell the difference. Okay. Um, also, right now, calling like crazy, and we'll talk about calling, um, is our chorus frogs, and this is a little male chorus frog on the side of a pond. And these things are everywhere. And I just found this one and took a picture, um, not this particular picture, I think it was, that was the other picture, um, in a water collecting area in front of the Walmart on 84th, North 84th Street. I, w I went there to get my every other week food and um, I said, wait a minute, that's Sudacris maculata. And I went over to the parking lot, which was an auto place, and sure enough, they were calling, and they were calling because they called 
uh, when it's cloudy during the day, not only at night. Of course, they're more prominent calling at night. And um, there were calling, I mean, by the hundreds um, in this pond that was no bigger um, than, this, than maybe 400 square foot. Um, and again, right off of a Walmart parking lot, a super Walmart parking lot. And of course, we have our tree frogs, and this is the same animal, um, just in different um, colorations, different chromatophores. And these guys are out right now. They're just starting to call, um, and they will be on trees and under lights at night. Uh, they can easily be seen. Um, some of the others that will be out are the cricket frogs that are as small as this guy. Um, and just to tell you, these are about two to three inches from here to here, up to two to three inches. These guys are only a half inch from here to here. See, if I put a ruler in there, you wouldn't be able to see that. And probably this week, there's going to be the tadpoles of the chorus frog first, and they look like little black commas. And so this is just a bunch of tiny, tiny um, tadpoles. And so if you see these, this is just like seeing the frog. And yes. I can, if I get a good picture of a tadpole, I can tell you what frog it's going to grow up into. Okay. Um, I can even tell you, if you get a good picture of you find that was jelly eggs, get a picture of that jelly eggs, I can identify what species it's from. Okay. So all this can be done by the experts. Now, when it comes to frog, this time of year, from the end of March, well into June, the males are given what we call advertising calls. And you can, and this is one at night, this is a woodhouse toad, um, the type of frog that's very common in terrestrial areas, but also goes to aquatic areas to call. And as you can see, his resin pouch is out. And you can get these calls, you can do it like I did it with this bullfrog, no, that's just, Actually, that's the cover of my CD. Um, you can use a, your phone to record. You can use a small recorder, and you can I'll show you one in, in the small picture of me. You can see one of the recorders I used when I was doing this. And they do sell recorders that you can place out um, that record for a whole month at a time. These are fairly expensive, the professional one here about thousand dollars and these uh, cheaper ones, the cheapest ones, in, more inexpensive ones are only two hundred fifty dollars. Um, but again, your phone will work fine for recording this. You're saying, well, how do I know what I'm hearing when I hear these? Well, all you have to do is go to my website and we'll go there right now so I'll show you how to find all the frog calls on the website. And these frog calls on this website are not like any other website. These are all Nebraska dialects. Yes, there is a difference. So don't go to Frog Watch USA or any of those other places from back east. Go to this site. Okay, it's 100% free and all the calls are Nebraska frogs. Give me one second here. Make sure I get to the site first and then I'll share that screen with you. And I have to do one more thing here so you can hear it properly. Okay, so this is the site and this is the home page. When you go to the site, I just want to show you here. Um, and you would go to identification, frogs and toads, but when you're not doing um, the iNaturalist for this event, you can put your reportings there, 
and um, if you find something and you don't what, know what it is, you can upload a picture and send it to me, that's here. Um, and we need to update the projects I'm doing in my students, but we'll get that done. But if you go to identification and go to frogs and toads, or just go scroll down and go to the frogs and toads, and then I'll have them here. You can kind of go what they look like, and we'll go to, let's see, we'll go to the, now let's go to the cricket frog. So you'll see that, yes, Lancaster County is part of its range, and you just click on the cricket frog. And by the way, the cricket frog could have green, yellow, or red. So you don't go by color. Color is like hair color on people. You never go by color when it comes to reptiles and amphibians. That doesn't tell you what it is. And then it'll give you information about it and its diet. And you keep going down right here. Listen to Blanchard's Cricket Frog Call. Click on this. Okay. And you can just click on play. Cricket frogs, the northern cricket frog, inhabits the majority of Nebraska, except for the panhandle in western sandhills. It's a small, less than one inch body length frog with a warty or bumpy skin. The coloration can be tan to dark brown and sometimes have rust or greenish hues to the coloration along the back. If you look closely, you may see a triangle of darker pattern between the eyes. This small frogs like sandy, muddy areas along slow-moving streams, ponds, and wetlands. They don't climb very well, and when startled, it will jump into the water that they remain close to and then directly swim back to the shore. They begin calling in mid-April and will call well into July. Here is the call of the northern cricket frog, Acris crepitans. <laughs> you can go to that and again um, so it, all the frogs also have a verbal description in microhabitat that I give before the call so it's even helpful for um, those who have a pro uh, those young people who have trouble reading yet because they're so young and so you can go through that as well now with turtles, of course, there's no calls, but you can easily see these if they're basking. So with turtles, you need it the warmest part of the day this time of year, and look for places where they can sit and bask. And so here we have some regular sliders, which in Lancaster County, they're here, but they're invasive here. But we still want to know how many invasives we have of these turtles. So they're a member of our state, but only the in Richardson County, Nebraska, are they our genotype that belongs here? Uh, all across Lincoln, Grand Island, and Omaha, they're all the invasive ones, primarily from pet shops in Florida. But this is uh, one in a pond in uh, Sarpy County, um, and it's a painted turtle, which is supposed to be our most prominent turtle across the state, including Douglas Sarpy in Lancaster County and you can see the, the color and this was taken from quite a distance and this picture here is a blandings turtle which is a, it's the most endangered turtle in the state and it's also critically endangered in the united states in canada and there it's mainly in the sand hills but this particular picture was taken at fontenot forest so one made it to fontenot forest so it's possible to see a blandings turtle uh, and also, um, my good friend and herpetologist, Dan Fogel, 
photographed one at Two Rivers State Park, which is in Douglas County. And I found one at Memphis, which is in Saunders County, I believe. So it, we would want to know if there's a Blanding's turtle in Lancaster County. So get, that's one, it, I mean, take a picture. No matter how blurry it may be, I can probably tell it. They're very distinctive. And we need to know if any, none have ever been found in Lancaster County. And we want to know if they're here. Okay. Dennis, why do you think, um, do you think they're moving on their own or do you think that people are moving those turtles? Well, right now we have the ability to test that. So, um, cause we do, we cut their fingernails and we do stable isotopes. So I can tell you if that animal was born in the sand hills or it was eaten in the sand hills last year. So we have the science now and that's what usually when conservation officers find them um, or they see someone has one they of course confiscate it because it's a, you're not supposed to touch it it's a critically endangered species and it's tier one in Nebraska um, and then they'll bring it to me and I'll do the genomics and we'll find or the stable isotopes to find out where it came from the ones at two river now again oh, um, we don't know for sure because we didn't, weren't able to capture it to get the fingernail. But we're thinking it possibly could have came when we had some flooding years. Because when the Niobrara was flooding, it goes right through their main part of their habitat. And if they get flooded out in the Niobrara, they end up in Missouri or the, they can get into the flat. Um, or probably in the upper reaches of the Elkhorn which dumps into the flat at two rivers is in their range. So when the, when the Elkhorn was flooding, like it was in 12 and in 19, was it 19 or 18, they could have accidentally been washed into two rivers and into uh, the flat and down to Platsma. So we don't know. No, we need more data, which if you see one in, Lancaster County, we'll go net for it and, get, and figure out, you know, what we'll do is we usually hold it, find out where it's from, if it's from the sand hills, we give them a nice little ride back, we don't charge them, and we put them back where they're supposed to be. If, if it actually has been there for a while, the stable isotopes tell us someone didn't move it, then we'll put it right back in Lancaster County. Thanks for sharing that. Yep. So this, you can tell, this is a beautiful picture someone took of a painted turtle. And I can see this right now, and I can tell you this is a, a, a just sexually mature one by the size reference. And I can tell you right now, uh, by looking at it, this is a male. And so there's a lot of information that experts can get on these animals. It has nothing to do with the color, okay? The color has nothing doesn't have uh, coloration that tell us the gender, it's something else. And of course, also out that can be seen, but hard, but could be a snake sunning itself on the road. And here is a eastern hognose on a gravel road. Um, and this one actually was just east of here in um, Oto County but they, it's a possibility that they are in Lancaster County. They're a toad eater, and they have been known to be in Lancaster County. Not too many, but that's still something you can find. But any snake on the road basking, because at the warmest part of the day, they want to get that sun because they're ectotherms. And of course, garter snakes are going to be the big thing. And we, <coughs> excuse me, we do have four types of garter snakes. Two are very common in Lancaster County. One's a possibility, and the fourth one you won't find in Lancaster County. Uh, it's only found in Sioux County. Um, but I can, by looking at this picture, I can tell you this is the plains garter snake. It's not the common garter snake. And so it has nothing to do with color. That stripe could be yellow, green, red, blue, cream, orange. 
that does not tell me what species it is. That's just tell me a little about their genes. Just like we have blondes, redheads, brunettes. That's all color tells us. And again, they'll usually curl up like this in your lawn. Perfect picture. And if you, you know, if you get a, I can tell by the grass how big it is. But if you threw a ruler by it, that's even better. Yep. And this is something that uh, Allie's been seeing in her yard. And this is, again, the plains garter snakes. And they're all plains garter snakes, even some are more vivid than the others. And this is what we see this time of year. This is called a mating aggregation, um, where when a female comes out of hibernation or brumnation, really, um, the males will uh, inseminate her for, so she can give birth in August. So if you find a small snake in April, May, June, it was born the year before. Um, all our snakes either hatch or are born live in end of August through October and because of the ectotherms. So any small one tells us how many are making it through the winter. So take pictures of the babies because if you get a baby during this uh, time it tells us oh a good percentage are made it through the winter. And we had a pretty hard winter this winter for, for snakes. Now remember we said these animals are secretive. So there's something you can do. You can carefully lift rocks and logs to look for these things. And the majority of snakes and lizards are going to be under rocks and logs, and including salamanders, but chance of finding a salamander in Lancaster County is like one in a thousand nowadays because we've lost them. So you would carefully lift it up and make sure you don't lift anything that's too heavy for you. And then Remember, whether you find anything or not, the number one rule is you put the rock, piece of wood, or log exactly back where you found it. And if it's in a moist area, like where salamanders could possibly be, or lizards, when you break up that rock or pick that rock up, you're breaking the moisture seal. So what I always do, you can look at the little picture of me, I get natural spring water or just drinking water, not tap water, and I put a little right under the rock where I broke that suction and put the rock or log back. Rehydrate because if it's a hot day and things are drying up, it hasn't rained for a while, that moisture will stay under that log and rock for a long time. But as soon as you break that and allow air underneath there, you're causing desiccation or drying up of that poor animal's habitat. So give them a little water. Doesn't take much. A couple of thimbles full. That's all. We have a lot of places, um, not as many in Lancaster County, but in surrounding areas and definitely in Douglas and Sarpy County, where we have rock outcroppings along roads. Now, if these are private lands, you do not go on private lands unless you get permission. And by regulation, if it's a Department of Roads land, you're supposed to get permission from the Department of Roads. And I don't know how you want to instruct that, Allie, because um, I get permission from the Department of Roads before I do anything on roadside. And, um, but, you know, it, it's hard to say, you know, there's no road police out there, but there is a regulation that you're not supposed to lift anything up or do any searching on what's called the rights away of roads between the edge of the road and the private property without permission from the Department of Roads, either County Department of Roads or State Department of Roads. Yeah, you lift the rock up, it's best to have two people, one to lift the rock up. Notice this gentleman has his uh, scale there so if there's something there you can throw down the tape measure and then some one of these the person not holding the rock up can photograph the animal so all he has is a notebook a pencil a um, tape measure and this person I just happen to know has a smartphone in his other hand for taking the picture 
So if you're working with families or pairs, it makes it a lot easier. And again, even small rocks. I don't know if you can see the smallmouth salamander. They were out this week. I went to Nemahaw County at night, and uh, well, a friend of mine did some looking for me too, and three of them were found. They're moving, right? This week they started moving. I'm not going to tell you where because they're rare. But things like ringnecks are under rocks right now. You lift rocks, you'll find ringnecks. And ringnecks are one of the most common snakes in Lancaster County. It doesn't grow bigger than 10 inches, and it'll stay there for a minute for you to take a picture of it. And then you just put the log or rock right back down. Don't worry about squishing them, just put it down slowly. Remember, they were under there, and there's actually more space when you put the rock back down or log back down than there was originally. Just don't step on it. And here, um, a friend of Kansas took this picture, but this is a Great Plains skink in which it's mainly in Gage County, but two, two only have been found in Lancaster County. How many more do we have in Lancaster County? And here's the fun part. They weren't found in Pioneer's Park or Wilderness Park. The only two Great Plains skinks found in Lancaster County were on school playgrounds in the middle of the city. And so the rock was lifted. Not only, this was done in June, not only is a Great Plains skink mom, but there's her young. And here's one, you lift up the log, and this is a bigger one. Lizard from out west, actually. Now, if you can do it safely, um, overnight, if you, especially if it's raining at night, you will see uh, frogs and toads. Of course, we only have salamanders left in Douglas, Tharpe, or Lancaster, but maybe you're real, real lucky, you might see a salamander crossing the road at night. Um, remember, don't use search lights when there's traffic. And if there's traffic, you have to stay away from those roads. Um, and you have to think about safety, but if you, if you spotlight a frog on the side of the road and someone keeps that light on the frog, the frog will stay still if it's an incandescent light. It will become mesmerized by the light and then you can just go up and take a picture of it okay you don't get too close it won't hop away it'll just stare at the light safety first so put your flashes on make sure the car is between you and where you're standing in the road so you don't get you no know, nothing like that can happen but on all, all the way gravel roads this is a great thing Rainy nights for amphibians, warm nights for snakes and lizards. And again, I, I'd like to thank everybody who's going to participate in this for helping with um, in all our fields. And any questions right now? Thank you so much for sharing, Dennis. Um, while we wait for some questions in the chat, I have one about skinks. You were talking about the picture of the parent and then there were maybe some babies in the picture too. Um, so I'm curious, do they provide maternal care at all? Skinks do have maternal care, parental care for their eggs and usually not the young. So those just came out of the egg, but the young have a tendency to stick around under that same rock where they hatch for quite a while. Um, but skinks are pretty much our only um, herbivora in the state that has any parental care. None of our snakes have parental care. Um, virtually none of our amphibians have parental care and none of our turtles have parental care. Um, besides a little bit of egg tending in the beginning with turtles. But our skinks, do have parental care. And it's primarily of the eggs. They'll turn the eggs. They'll actually uh, get water in their lymph glands near their coecal opening. 
and keep those eggs moist. That's really cool. I didn't know that. Thank you. Yep. That was published by Lou Selma, who's now at Gainesville, Florida. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, I did just put a link in the chat for an evaluation. If you want to give us some feedback about the program, let us know how we did. Um, we have a question from Heidi. Which snakes give live birth? Okay, do you want, uh, it's about uh, probably a little less than half in Nebraska. So all our nectar trees, that means all our garter snakes are live birth. Our water snake is live birth, and here's the cool part. Our water snake is not only live birth, but it's matotrophic, which means it's exchange between the mother and the babies. Kind of like us, not much different, okay? It's not a egg hatching the body. It's not lithotrophic live birth. It's matotrophic live birth, like a placenta. That's our water snakes. Um, all our... Um, Viper Day, so all three of our rattlesnakes give live birth. The copperhead gives live birth. And then there's some smaller snakes that are nectatrines, like the brown snake, which is only six inches. It gives live birth. And the little tiny young are only a quarter inch when they come out. It's amazing when they come out of the mother um, and they just gather out. Um, our worm, uh, let's see, worm snake eggs, I think. I think I've got most of them. Yeah, it's about a third, a third of our snakes um, give live birth. Okay, we have another question. How many eggs do turtles lay? Depends on the turtle. Do you call it a clutch? Yes, we do. Very good. Um, so the clutch of a snapping turtle. Um, and those eggs are 100% round. They look like ping pong balls. And a good sized snapping turtle, a mature snapping turtle, which is about 20 years old and about two foot in diameter, she can lay 30 to 40 eggs in a clutch. Now, here's the clue or the thing. 90% of those eggs will get eaten by raccoons and skunks. So only 10% will even hatch because those animals will eat those eggs. Things like a, our yellow mud turtle, she only lays one egg at a time and only two eggs in a year. So it depends on the turtle. Awesome, well I do just wanna say really quick, um, the City Nature Challenge will be taking place um, the end of April through May 3rd for that observation window. So in, during that time frame, those four days, you can upload um, all of your observations to iNaturalist. Um, for things like reptiles, amphibians, and turtles, Dennis um, recommends that you obscure your location because um, there are some people out there who use iNaturalist as a tool to find those animals. Um, and we want to keep them safe. So if that's something you can easily do on iNaturalist, if you have questions about that, you can um, reach out to me and I can help you figure out how to do that. Um, we have one more question in the chat. How far can box turtles travel? Okay, so just ironic you asked that question last, well, June of 2019. Uh, we had two PhD, PhD students uh, earn their PhD um, by working for one for six and one for five years on doing telemetry. We put transmitters on ornate box turtles. And so we had a lot of good what we call spatial data. It's not all that far. Um, and believe it or not, box turtles, very few of them may this far. Most of the ones, uh, box turtles, or any box turtles that you find in Lancaster County were transplanted by people. Here's the reason. They're in the sand hills because when it gets cold, they can dig in the sand and go deep enough so they don't freeze to death. 
they have a very hard time digging in clay soil that we have here in Lancaster County. So the ornate box turtle, an individual, a male, probably won't, I have to look at the data, but probably won't travel more than a mile radius in its home range. A female, it's going to be a lot less than that. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, we do have our next session in the speaker series on Tuesday at seven. Um, that'll be looking at fungi, slime molds, and other fun forms. Um, so if you wanna join us on Tuesday at seven, um, but thank you so much, Dennis, for helping us today and sharing all of your information. And I did this one. I don't, I don't have to do the other one because I'm a fun guy. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> you mean mycology. I got it. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, bye. Good to see you. People like Vicki, Kat, and Dave, and everybody else, and Carol, all these people I recognize.